So welcome everyone again to today's webinar on building Koya and how to succeed and avoid operational pitfalls. I'm excited to welcome in our guest today, Marco Matla, Dustin Baker, and Maya French, who will be able to walk through their story. This presentation is going to be split into two parts. First, we're going to have Marco share some of his experience. He's an expert in operations working with emerging brands on what he's seen to emerging brands do to find success and avoid failure at those early stages. And then we're going to jump into sharing the story of building Koya with Maya and Dustin. As I mentioned, if you have questions throughout today's presentation, feel free to jump into the chat and ask away. This is for you so that you can take away as much as possible. So I want to first welcome Marco. Marco works with tons of CPG brands and helping them with their operations so that they can uh, find that success as they're building their companies. Marco, I'd love for you to just give a quick one minute overview of the types of brands and projects that you work on to set the context. Sure, so um, like Jordan said, I work with at JPG um, Resources, and you know we do all kinds of projects. Um, you know, I've I'll back up. You know, I started I've worked half of my career in industry, half of it in consulting. So I've seen what good has looked like um, from those experiences. And so what I've taken is tried to to harness all that information of what's good, and kind of package that into something that that can be distilled down for emerging brands start and small brands so that they can avoid the pitfalls that commonly happen right and it's it's a way of keeping them from learning things the hard way versus learning from someone who's been there and can help them kind of sidestep those pitfalls um so again we work with everyone from emerging brands to sometimes larger um cpg brands i work primarily in operations and supply chain. So everything from working with contract manufacturers, producing um, production schedules, helping them avoid some of the roadblocks that come along with that. Um, also leading a lot of SNOP um, implementations. Awesome, Marco. And I know you've seen a lot. We were chatting a little bit before this and I was telling the story of my previous company, T-Squares, and we made functional energy bars went from, you know, had no idea how to make energy bars when I started in the industry, had no food experience. And we went from starting in a commercial kitchen to moving to a contract manufacturer who we eventually realized the product would not work there based on their equipment. Brought back in house for a while, moved to another contract manufacturer that also didn't work and ultimately had to move it back in house. I'm curious to know what you found has been some of the keys to helping emerging brands build successful operations processes for their businesses. Yeah. So what, you know, what we typically look at is we make sure that, you know, we can, we can jump in and look at their process holistically, right? What are the objectives that the founders have um, in terms of building their project? Um, right. So looking at a contract manufacturer, for instance, right. Do you want to be one that just, does a turnkey solution, right? Where everything is handled, you turn over the formula and the contract manufacturer knows your expectations, you run trials and everything works perfectly. Do you want that hybrid solution where the founder might want to bring in certain ingredients or certain blends that they're really passionate about or are key to their, to their product? Or do you wanna have a manual process where you're bringing in all the packaging, all the ingredients? Um, you know, that in and of itself can, you know, free up hours of your time, right? Or even weeks at a time. Um, if you're bringing everything in yourself, that's a lot of work. Um, if you're letting the command handle it, a lot easier. So we'll look at that. We'll look at inventory. Um, how are you managing your inventory? Make sure you have enough to satisfy orders, not too much, because if you have too much inventory, um, of course, that money could be spent elsewhere on the business. And we always want to be very mindful of the limited money that that companies have um, and how they're using it and making sure that they're using it most effectively. 
Marco, I'm kind of curious too, when you find uh, situations where you come in and things are are not set correctly or, or sometimes, you know, could be improved, where are you finding the biggest issues? Um, I, again, I like to look at it holistically, right? Um, oftentimes coming in, the first conversations are, I kind of think of it as dr drinking out of a fire hydrant. Um, you'll have a lot of information coming your way and then you have to take everything that they're telling you, all the struggles that they've had and kind of internalize that and then kind of step away and take a look at it, you know, holistically and say, what are the areas where you can kind of help? Is it a com is it a production issue? Is it an inventory management issue? Is it a distribution issue? Um, you know, we can then focus and, and give advice and guide them in a way that's, that's going to lead the, to the best results for them. One of the biggest things that I realized from my own experience is that I didn't know what I didn't know. And so it was taking things kind of one step at a time, making mistakes, learning that there are pre-existing ways of, of doing so, which is part of one of the reasons I started Food Bevy because I felt like I was reinventing the wheel on stuff that obviously has been done before and optimized, yet I was kind of struggling and stumbling through making these mistakes kind of day by day. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's, that's the benefit of working with someone, right. Um, and not doing it yourself. You get to learn and avoid those pitfalls uh, by, by having someone say, Hey, this might be coming up, or I see this as a potential issue down the road. Let's let's try to kind of calm those waves now so that it doesn't become a tsunami later. Yeah, and I was talking, talk to founders to say, right, when you're building a, a CPG brand especially, you're constantly balancing sales and operations along with that. And right, like finance is definitely important to make sure you have the money to support it. But it's really this balance between how much can we grow our sales and what operations do we need to support it? So as you mentioned, you don't make too much inventory where you have cash sitting on hand where it expires, where you're not overselling to the point where you can't actually produce your product at scale and finding that right partner. And it's uh, definitely like a, one of the trickiest balances that I see. Yeah, it's definitely uh, allowing allowing companies to work on their business instead of in their business, right? If you can take away some of the noise and and busy work that a lot of founders do, um, they can actually work on the strategy, the sales, uh, making sure that they have the right distribution, the right channels, making the right connections in order to grow their band, grow their brand, and then allow that day to day noise to be handled by experts that can do that and have seen it um, and that can keep them in the loop of their issues. But um, again, working on their business instead of in their business. Yeah, I think that's that's so important. And, you know, as I've learned from my own experience, like starting a any type of food business is definitely tough and has its own challenges, but can also be really rewarding and, and scale. And I think, you know, as you kind of talk about kind of seeing things holistically as well, I want to bring in Dustin and Maya, who were talking about their experiences in building Koya, because, you know, building a kind of plant-based smoothie drink that is growing, is refrigerated, is a really tough thing to, to start. And they've been able to find success with that business as well. And it's kind of grown to being one of the the key national brands in the space. So Dustin and Maya, I want to invite you on. They are the two co-founders of Koya. And I'd love for you to just give a quick um, overview on what those the origins of Koya were and how you got started. Yeah, great. Um, so um, Maya and I met in 2011. And um, after becoming great friends, um, we discovered that Maya uh, had was lactose intolerant, which is not incredibly uncommon as we know now know. But at the time, um, milk alternatives, dairy alternatives, this whole um, movement in the in the food culture um, had not occurred yet. And really, it was just the players like Silk Almond Milk, um, Orgain. There was just like nobody out there really doing it in a big way. Um, so we saw an opportunity um, to um, put together um, this protein and milk alternative uh, product together 
having no clue that um, this segment, um, product segment was going to take off in the in the way that it did. So uh, we have just been, you know, on that ride for some time now. And um, I, I would also add, um, I think the, the, the best thing about that not having knowledge was we read a lot of mommy blogs and we were like, well, how do they make protein drinks? And we really set out to just fix everything that was wrong with protein drinks. I think as yeah. we were market testing and understanding what the other ones tasted like, uh, some of the problems that we saw were texture, uh, the grittiness of protein beverages, um, not having enough protein so which made us look into alternative sources of protein that would be more complete and bioavailable um, that wouldn't cause like gut issues or bloating some of the things that I hated experiencing after a workout um yep yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. and I'd say like preserving the nutritional value um so at that time um everybody was doing um tetra packs which are the little cardboard uh cartons like similar to milk boxes you'd see in elementary schools and we were really big into like the cold juice uh, movement that was going on. And so we didn't see anything like this in the cold shelf at Whole Foods, for example. And we're like, that needs to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we actually started off as a juice company. Um, and that be, that product, it didn't fail, but it was, it was too labor intensive. And the nutritionals just didn't make sense for what we were trying to do. Um, so we took a lot of nods from, from creating the juice company and, and applied that to protein drinks, which made it stand out more on shelf. Because as you know, juices have all of their ingredients listed on the front of the label. That's something we also did with our protein drink. We we put all the ingredients on front. So some of the early iterations of Koya, which was Raw Nature 5, um, we had chia seeds on, in it. We had, you know, you know, different types of proteins. We had cacao powder and that was all listed. So it made it for a very easy decision for the consumer. Um, instead of having to turn it around, they just made a three second decision. And if they did turn it around, it matched. Yeah, my I love that story. I'm curious about that origin because right, it is almost 10 years ago now, but take us back to that moment when you're running the the juices and you're like, this is it's fine, but like there has to be something else. What led you to like protein specifically? And then how did you ultimately make the switch to focusing on um, what would become Koya and that line of protein drinks? <laughs> So I'm just going to put it out there. That was my idea. And Maya was against it. And yeah, I love literally it. what we did was we were about 40 stores. I just started delivering protein drinks to our customers. <laughs> and I was, gonna, I was just so confident. Maybe you don't know what you don't know. I didn't even know. I just believed I was passionate. <laughs> and there was a lot of uh, meeting of world, you know, because I'd mentioned that Maya, we did just find out she's lactose intolerant. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about all well, kind of things. How can she still get her protein? I was literally thinking about the things that, you know, I don't even have the problem. I was like, we have to get this girl nutrition, but she can't have dairy. How do we do that? And so that was a solution for her. So I will give her credit in that, that she was a complete inspiration mm -hmm. um, behind that decision. But to Maya's point, we just saw like players like Suja coming in. We saw um, stores taking the produce that was kind of on the last leg and they were making their own cold press juice and selling it in the store. We saw the market getting very crowded. And so instead of just doing like a slow death or having to lower our prices to nothing, uh, we just pivoted. And that's something we still practice in our business today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, it's something that I see a lot of founders struggling with as well is like, when do we change? Like, when do we realize things aren't working? And then how do we get the inspiration to to change into something that will? Because I remember like juice shops and fresh pressed juices were all the rage there. They were coming out. It seemed like it was the next big thing. And then things started to like settle out pretty quickly and almost uh, feel like it's still health. It's still really valuable as a nutritional source. But from like the beverage shelf or the uh, kind of packaged beverage on the shelf, a lot of those products kind of started the declining. So as you moved into protein, what were some of those challenges of building this like refrigerated plant-based protein business when you were almost building the category itself? Yeah, there were so many challenges. I think, I think I want to say maybe it was about we were in business like 2013 to 2015 was kind of the startup of Raw Nature 5, um, which was the the previous name of before Koya. And our biggest challenge was milk stability uh, and just like creating a scalable 
product in, in general. Um, we, we wanted this milk like texture so much, but we didn't know how to make almond milk. And there was like no information on how to make your own almond milk that didn't separate. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say we had all the challenges. So, I mean, I think this would be really important um, to the viewers is that it is great to be kind of like the first, like the pioneer of anything, because that's so exciting. And, you know, those brands will exist forever. Like Red Bull stands out in the energy category just because they were kind of the first to market. But with that comes its own set of challenges, unique challenges. So, you know, we were in Chicago. Um, we were at Purdue University using traditional dairy equipment to try to make a milk protein alternative uh, product. And so we didn't have the right tools for the job. Um, nobody really knew what we were trying to do. It hadn't really been done. People were like, what are you, this doesn't even make sense. It was like, and why? <laughs> we, yeah, we wasted a lot of money mm -hmm. um, using different pasteurization techniques and stuff until we finally dialed in on the formula that you see today. So every challenge. I, I say one of the things that really helped us figure it out um, were two things. Uh, one, we always attend IFT in Chicago um, to see what are the new latest and greatest um, ingredients on the scene and, and really just trying to, we came there with a problem. And we so it really. Can you share what IFT is? I know the oh, yeah. Institute of Food Technologists mm -hmm. and their show. Yeah. Um. So it's the uh, um. It's an annual um ingredient food trade show, and so you have um ingredient vendors. You have new and exciting um ingredients um being displayed, and you also have food scientists everywhere. So all the formulators from different companies come to see what's the latest and greatest. So to my point, mm -hmm. um, this we leverage this as a huge resource because Chicago is a food and beer town kind of, you know, and no, where do you go to figure out how to make almond milk? And and so we started leveraging just industry trade shows. Mm -hmm. The the other the other thing was leveraging our our network. Um, we had a few advisors who knew people, um, and so we ended up finding someone who had worked at what was it Dean Dean Foods, um, and doing some work with him to kind of just understand the, the what would I say the biological makeup of just almond milk in general, and just understanding like what were we doing wrong in the process. So then, you know, translating that over to at scale when using the dairy equipment and, you know, there might be certain steps that we just didn't think about that could be um, transferable from dairy to plant-based milk. And yeah, I think those two things, resources and just trade shows really helped us solve the problem. Talk to me about the transition um, into the Koya branding what kind of led that way? Why did you decide to change the name? And what was that process like for you? <laughs> you remember the answer to that? I know. I know. It's a lot of answers to this. Uh, for, okay. I have a really funny story. Uh, JPG, uh, <laughs> Jeff, he was one of our early advisors. Jeff Grog. Jeff Grog, one of our early advisors and investors. At this point, we were self-manufacturing and self-distributing um, in our own kitchen. He came to our kitchen one day in 2015, right before the holidays and said, no, this needs to shut down. <laughs> and so uh, very disappointing. We we had to kind of get rid of all of our staff at that point in time and just start over. We, we exited all of our current accounts and really doubled down on focusing to get the formula right. Uh, we were using high pressure pasteurization at the time. And um, after a ton of testing, we realized that we couldn't get past a 30 day shelf life uh, with because it was a low asset product. And most distributors require a 75 day minimum. Mm -hmm. So it was imperative for us to find a different solution. So we worked with uh, Jeff, JPG and a uh, consultant who's amazing. Um, <laughs> and he helped us with Purdue University and Ohio University, Ohio State University. And that was a very like cost effective route for us because it's it's really just like a donation. And then we, we teach the students, but we also use the lab equipment and we got it done within three months. But we also knew that Raw Nature 5 wasn't great because I got on the Steve Harvey show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's a whole, another that's a whole story. Other but thing. when yeah. we brought in um, advisors and mentors and investors, um, we kept hearing, you know, if we hear something more than twice or especially three times, um, okay, pause, 
think about what's going on here, question it. And the concern was that the word raw. So at that time, naked um, juice smoothies were under a bunch of scrutiny and they were getting sued for making claims about being natural and all these things. And they're like, can you use that? The FDA was trying to catch up with all these natural products. So the word raw put a lot of fear into our investors. And we said, you know what, that's fine. Uh, we use it as an opportunity to spend some of that investor money. And we did this amazing rebrand with um, the Interact Agency out of Boulder. Mm -hmm. Hats off to those guys. They're amazing. And um, we started from an empty vessel. The word Koya doesn't mean anything. However, one of the branding people are from Hawaii. So I'd have to say that had to be influenced a little bit, but we loved it. It made sense. And we ran with it. Well, it, it means something. It, it mean it's uh, well, short for Nicoya Peninsula, which is a blue zone, which which people live uh, the healthiest in the blue zones, and they have mostly plant based diets. So it, it derives from that. No, I love that, and I think real word. Yeah, it's in a real. Word. <laughs> That's one of the uh, you know interesting things about coming up with a a name because at the it's it's very important from the standpoint of it's what people are going to use to like reference and refer to you, and some names have meaning embedded with it like you mentioned the term raw people come with preconceived notions but if you're able to come with an empty vessel as you mentioned like the name koya where you can build on the meaning and almost create that meaning on its own then it allows you to do most of that work without relying on other people's assumptions within there and i'm familiar with the interact team as well and they know cbg uh really well and know how to build great brands and and great products uh, around it so i think that's really exciting I'm curious, was there a point that you knew there was an inflection point in the business to say like, wow, like this is actually really working, whereas you knew with the raw juice business, there there were problems. Was there any one moment or um, a series of moments that you remember? I mean, this answer sounds, I don't want to cut no, you off. Go ahead. Mine's really short. Yeah, Yours might ahead. be um, better, mm -hmm. but it was immediate. <laughs> and I, I can't say that enough. And it might be an anomaly and we might not only experience that like a couple more times in our life, right? But it just worked from the get-go. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can put a product out there that you don't have to explain how it works and it just kind of can be a standalone on the shelf and it can be a discovery product, that's a great product in my opinion. And that's what the protein was. It just worked. Yeah. And uh, we were like, so we knew within a week that this is where we're going. Yeah, I'll elaborate on that and say um, after the juices, we did try a couple of other iterations of products. So we came out with like a yoga drink that was celery based. Um, we came out with a, a, a version of like the detox um, elixir. elixir. And one thing that I would note when we had the detox elixir, it would sell when I was demoing it. And but when we left the demo, it would not move. And so as soon as the protein drinks, as soon as we introduced that during demos, people understood it right away. And once we left, it's still sold. And so that's the thing. It's like not having to physically be there to, to sell it. And yes, it's just selling itself off the shelf because customers understand it. The call outs are very clear. The value proposition is very clear and people need it. I think that's really key. Oh, go ahead, Dustin. I was going to say demos, um, I think, should never be slept on. I don't think a lot of people like to do demos, but that is your best information gathering session. I mean, people love to tell you what they think. And so if you just keep gathering that and looking at what are the trends, what am I hearing? Um, most of the changes we've made with Rolling Your 5 and Koya were really gathered from um, interactions with customers. Yeah, I really want to highlight that because I mentioned the brand I ran before T-Squares and we were based in Chicago as well. And one thing that I realized was that the product was very complicated, I'll say, right? Like some might say innovative, but in some ways, like I made it very complicated where we had four major points of differentiation against the industry. And that showed up doing demos because we experienced the same thing where when I was there selling the product, people, and we were in Whole Foods, right? People would come and say like, oh, these taste really good. But I like saw them on the shelf and I thought it was interesting, but I didn't buy it. And realized at that point that there is some uh, miscommunication in terms of what the product was and what the expectation from the customer was compared to what we were selling. And I think that's so important that a lot of brands experience because the nature of creating something new. And if customers don't understand what your product is, or you have to spend a lot of time educating them, that's going to cost you a lot of money and a lot of money that's not really out there right now. And so I uh, 
compliment you on like actually listening to customers and being able to tell like what they were looking for and what they were not looking for. I know part of it is just through the iteration process, but the companies I've found that have products that really take off fast, it is, as you mentioned, like it's immediate, like customers get it. They buy it when you're there, they buy it when you're not there and they like truly understand what it is that you're selling and the product sells itself. So I think that's amazing. Thank you. Um, I'm also curious in terms of like, as you were building this, you had an opportunity to pitch to Whole Foods, right? How did that process go in getting into Whole Foods? Oh, yeah. Well, people think it's overnight, right? And I'll let you. No, no, why you would win, you too? But I will um, start nice. out by saying that we did live very closely um, to the Whole Foods office of the Midwest in downtown Chicago, which helped. Um, but we got into a couple of stores. I think it was Lincoln Park, which is a high volume store, and then Lakeview. And we were relentless in performing demos there um, to introduce the product to customers. And so given that, we really focused on making sure we had really great sales, which made it an easier decision for them. So I'll let you go into the actual like process of getting the Whole Foods natural. Oh, you're doing a great job. No, 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 because you went into the meeting, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Um. well, you know, some of that stuff, that was all of that. We were actually advised not to start approaching Whole Foods stores one by one because they like to do things by region, but we we did it anyway, right? We broke some rules, all right? Ask for forgiveness later. But we did get that National Whole Foods meeting, and that was because of um, really just relationships, right? So um, we went to Expo West, didn't know what it was, literally had no idea. She just showed up there with some product in a backpack brand, right? Mm -hmm. Product in the bag. And uh, we were able to meet... Um, Bill Weiland, who is the owner of Presence Marketing, as you know, he happened to be in our backyard in Chicago, and uh, we used him as a resource before we ever started working with him. And so he was able to um, help facilitate getting us getting a meeting um, in Austin, Texas, at the national at the National Whole Foods, and we took the product um, in there. Had no idea what was going to happen. They took all five SKUs said we'll launch it um, nationally, but you could say that's luck. The guy was in a good mood. You never know. It's really daunting that it is one person at the other end of the table making decisions for an entire chain, but it is what it is. We went in there with a good attitude and um, yeah. yeah, but that's where the work started. I think, I think a couple of things that really made them make the decision for it to go national um, was that it was unique. There was nothing really besides Rebel that it, it existed in that category. Um, it was plant-based, which is very on trend. And also because we did the rebrand, um, it the branding was fit for commercialization on a national scale. Um, and so that, that really helped. And then also one of the things that th was their biggest concern is like, do we have enough money in the bank to support a national deal we did not <laughs> so what did you do right because it's not just giving into all those stores which is I, I feel like this is the the thing that hits every cpg founder like you get a yes from a big retailer a big opportunity you're like this is amazing you start celebrating you're like shit like i have to make all the prod we have to support it nationally what did you do after you got that yes we just thought that would be a great problem to have like well if we have this problem like some reason to give us money uh, you know, that wasn't necessarily that easy. It wasn't the case, but um, yeah. It was scary. Um, we had to like come up we had like our manufacturing cart kind of yelling at us. He's like, you got to come up with $40,000 tomorrow. So I remember us like sitting on the bed, like trying to figure out how to get a, a loan, like a person, take out a personal loan just did. to get through the, yeah, the next tranche before we could actually raise money. Yeah. We ended up Taking out but you know, Whole Foods wants you to make promises right there on the spot. Mm -hmm. So they're like, "When you need to have product to us by this day," and you don't want to say no, right? You don't want to like mess this up. So uh, we had very tight uh, timelines, and um, yeah, yeah, we we got it done. I mean, something else too. I would I would note, which was like an absolute nightmare because we wanted to be very close to our manufacturer. So we we ended up moving. We sublet. We lived together at the time as roommates, and we subletted our place to move to LA on a moment's notice. Um, and then when we were due to ship to every store at once, um, randomly had went in to just check in on the product at the warehouse and realized that we had spoilage issues. 
Oh yeah. no, that is a, a, a death knell. So what did you do after you found that there was spoiler uh, dishes? I mean, just to note that that part of the process, what that would call is a scale up. So you're going to go and everybody does, right? They go from making um, at the most, maybe they've ever made is like for beverages, 500 gallons of something, right? And now we're making 50,000 gallons per flavor, <laughs> just like that. There's going to be some changes and no matter we had a food scientist with this. We had like the full support of the manufacturing facility. It didn't matter because once again, this type of product really hadn't been vetted out completely yet. And um, and so, you know, we we just, you know, you bring in this, that's why you have advisors, that's why you have mentors around you. And, you know, it kind of takes the heat off of you too, because you go to a group of people and you just make the best decisions at with where you're at at that moment. Yeah. Luckily, we had enough cash on hand um, to produce right away and ask. Well, we had enough ingredients. Yeah, we, we, ingredients. We were advised to order yeah. two or three times X what we need mm -hmm. in case something like this would occur. And it did occur. And so <laughs> we were lucky to be prepared um, with those extra ingredients and we were able to produce that like next weekend and I, we had to pay for it for an entire year. I think my full-time job was working with dirty hands to make sure that all SKUs, merchandising, yeah, merchandising, making sure that all SKUs were on shelf in every single Whole Foods store, which took about a year. Because then you think, okay, for God's sakes, we got the product um, ready. It's good. And then we, we don't know what we don't know to your point, which I think is such a great thing because we didn't know mer what merchandisers even were. We thought once it gets to Whole Foods, they got us. They don't because there's a customer education period. They don't even know what your product is. It would just sit in the back. Nobody was even putting it out. Mm -hmm. And this is across 450 stores at once. So how do you solve that problem? So really, honestly, it's like just kind of getting punched, getting back up, you know, and it's just that process until you you get through it. Yeah, and we were on a split. <laughs> Yeah, and then you have a refrigerated product that had maybe ultimately up to a 75-day shelf life, which is still really short by the time it gets to, sure. to stores. So talk to me about like what else you learned from that launch process. So you have to figure out manufacturing and understand that that first scale-up process would have some hiccups. So one key takeaway, or there are more ingredients than you think you need so that you can give another shot because things likely will go wrong. You brought in the merchandising team to help make sure products got on the shelf and then presumably sold off the shelf. Um, what else did you learn about kind of making that national launch? Oh, man, so many, so many uh, lessons. I mean, it's it's impossible to do it right at the at the the first time. We had to spend a lot on demos too to just introduce the product. Um, and then also be very strategic. While we were on exclusive, um, we were actively, you know, selling into other to future accounts in the natural channel. And our strategy was to go really deep and natural first, and then uh, go to conventional. Which eventually that strategy changed. But I think still, still to this day, it's a it's a great strategy to kind of saturate uh, one segment of the market and then move over to more mass channels. Um, so. I don't know. There's a ton of. I have one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so um, it actually goes back to JPG resources. And this is when we really leaned heavy on JPG um, and Jeff Grog is because um, what we didn't have in place, and I can't even put enough emphasis on this. We didn't have systems and processes mm -hmm. in place. And that's contingencies for what happens if spoilage does occur. What do you do if you have to do a recall? Uh, we didn't have that stuff in place. And then just like documenting every single process, every single step along the way so it can be replicable. And so you can actually have your team facilitate um, these, these actions, right? So once we had that in place, it's almost like an insurance policy, right? It just, it gives you an extra layer of protection. Um, and I just can't emphasize a lot of entrepreneurs are like, I'm not slowing down to make that, but that is where the, that's the meat and potatoes of survival foundation yeah, yeah i love that i know at a certain point i think somewhere around like 2016 or so you brought on your third co-founder chris hunter as well who i've had the pleasure of meeting i'm curious to know kind of what led to you kind of bringing on someone else to help with growing the the company and what went into that decision yeah, so um, he was an early investor of ours, um, and he would advise us along the way. But when we got the National Whole Foods deal, uh, I think it was Bill Weil and a couple other people, they were just like, hey, like this is a really, really big deal, and you guys do not have the background or the experience to take this to the next level. Um, so, you know, maybe you should bring on a CEO, especially 
when it comes to raising money and having to raise, I think we raised $7.5 million. Dustin and I absolutely could not do that. And a CEO's job is to <laughs> raise money and consistently be raising money for the company. So we definitely needed the help and we're really happy to have him on board and to take on that, that huge task. And also just what does it look like building out a team? Like how do you prioritize who you need? Like, um, operations was really huge for us. That was one of our first hires, um, a controller, um, things like that we had no knowledge of. So being able to have someone kind of take the reins was super helpful for our growth. Yeah. But I, I, to that point, I, I, you know, if I'm just like giving out like a little like Easter egg here, I think the thing that why did Koya work with us is it's because we were easy to work with. We listened to our mentors. We mm -hmm. took criticism. We humbled ourselves. We really never got to a place where we thought we can do this. We don't need other people. We knew our strengths. We understood our weaknesses. And we just didn't slow down the, the success of the company. We didn't have to go through like, you know, so I just want to put that out there that like when you need to bring on someone's like, you need to bring on a CEO. We're like, we probably do. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. And we did it quickly, probably within a week. And so- you know, this thing was a rocket ship. Yeah, it saves a lot of time and saves a lot of money versus just kind of shooting uh, in the dark. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's really, really powerful, especially finding that right person because, you know, I think as you, you were able to quickly find product market fit with the, the drinks and next was really building what I call like business model fit. Like how do you take this drink and expand in a way that can actually grow the company and you're not, you're right, you're growing probably at a loss in those early days as you're expanding and there's cash flow um, implications, but the product's designed to actually grow and be successful. And you you mentioned around like actually listening to advisors and needing help. I remember like when I was younger at the beginning of starting T-Squares or something that I struggled with of having this vision as a founder and wanting to be have the product a specific way and then running into... Um, issues with just like how customers perceived our products, how advisors were telling us to to change and pivot and thinking that like I knew what was best. And I think that was something that was very wrong and something that I've since learned from a, a great deal of, you know, listening to customers, listening to advisors and being humble enough to know that like you don't have all the answers and that there's other people who can work alongside with you and compliment you and and can help out along that way. So kudos for you to kind of both being open to that. Maybe. And, and that becomes part of your identity. But then you also just got to think, what's the goal? Is your goal to be a big brand like, you know, like T-Squares or Akoya? Like if that's your goal, then like it makes it a little easier, I think, to like listen to that stuff. But if it's like, you know, you just want to, keep control of it, then you probably can. It just probably won't get as big as fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having different limitations. So you two are kind of growing Koya. It's now, I think, in over like 20,000 stores or so. Um, what are you up to now? I know you're, are you still actively kind of running in the day-to-day -day of, of Koya or are you exploring other projects? Uh, Dustin and I actually exited Koya in 2021. We just didn't make a huge BevNet announcement or anything like that. <laughs> it was during the pandemic. Um, and we really had this idea for the product that we have launched recently, which is Happy Pop. So I love that. Before we get into Happy Pop, I love to jump <laughs> into what that um acquisition was was <laughs> like and selling the company because I know that. That's a really big pivot point, right? You're like building something for so long and get to a point where you're like, okay, what do we do with it now? So can you take me back to, you know, were you looking for people to sell the company to? Did okay. people solicit you? Uh, I, I would say, I always tell founders this, sometimes when you're in a company, especially when you're doing it for a long time, you have to have an idea in mind of when you plan to exit. Like your, your personal plan isn't always aligned with, the plans of the investors or anybody else in your organization. So it's like, what works for you? And like, how much do you want to walk away with? And and when is the time that you think that you might want to step away for us? And I wanted value. Yeah, like, value. Have we maximized our value? Mm -hmm. You know, I did the company, it grew around us. I mean, it became a complete, well, you know, like I, this is what I tell entrepreneurs. I'm like, <laughs> look, this whole process, Koya went so fast. By the time I got comfortable, I'm talking like every two months, it was a completely different company. I'd go to a meeting. There's like five new employees. Who the hell are these people? It just happened so fast. And so I never got to get too comfortable in any one stage, right? But at the, 
by the time the pandemic happened, we had some time to think. We'd just been in this like fight or flight mode for so long, just running as fast as we could to keep up. And we're like, are we still maximizing our value to the company? That really was like that overhanging, lingering yeah. question. I think, you know, it got to a point where you're in every store, you're, you know, you're, everyone knows who you are. What it, What's next, right? Are you the person to take it to past 25 million to 50 million to 100 million? And then we decided, hey, we're not that people. We actually enjoy the zero to one stage. Like that is the most exciting for gotcha. us. Um, and, you know, that might be for with other products that we come out with in the future. And so we, um, it wasn't like, let's see, we didn't ring any alarms, but we did take a lot of time to think about it and had a conversation. Um, and we, it, it was hard to find because we were kind of in the middle right before another raise, before a series B. So that's really when you're right before another raise, it's probably the best time if you're thinking of taking an exit or taking cash off the table, because there are investors that are actively investing that you could sell to as secondary shares. Um, and that's exactly what we did. But if we were to do it now, it could be harder, right? Because we're not in the middle of a raise. So you have to like call up people and like, hey, does anyone want to to off, you know, buy some of these shares and people might not be, you know. And you don't want to sound the, the alarms either because, right, that could be like negative. Like, mm -hmm. why are the founders selling their shares to the company? Yes. Is something <laughs> wrong? So you have to be so delicate um, in that in that scenario too. And because we love Koya, we want it to be great. It's our baby. We want it, I want to see Koya on the shelves in 30 years still, right? Like yeah. it's our like, legacy. That's the ultimate goal um, for us is to, to put it in the hands of the people that it can last forever and it can outlive us. And so I don't know if other founders have that perspective with their company or their main goal is just to get like $600 million and peace out. But we really, really, <laughs> we really, really <laughs> love the products that we create. And we hope that, you know, whoever it sells to in the future, uh, whoever that big giant is, that they will take care of it and not bankrupt it. I know you probably can't go into like all the, the details, but did you learn any lessons now that's been a couple of years through your exit, things that you would do again or things that you would advise founders to to think about or consider so that they can be aware of what might happen? Gosh, um, yeah, I want to be um, very like diplomatic and like whatever I, I say here, but be very careful. Like you can't look the pain of not having capital when you need it in the first couple of years. It's like the most painful thing in the world, mm -hmm. but there is something more painful than that. And that is bringing on the wrong investors that aren't a good fit, maybe for the way you work or the company, but it's so tempting to take money. Somebody's offering, hey man, here's 50 grand. You really need it, but you don't realize that like, that is a marriage. You cannot change it. And I'm telling you one bad egg, one disruptor, like five board members, you got one guy, like, you know, it's not great. He, it kind of poisons the group. So having the education to know how to manage your board, bring on the right team and the right people early on sets the foundation for the rest of the years of the company. Yep. So just be very careful in that selection process. I, I would say um, value alignment is really important. Like what do people, like for us, we really value um, like culture and innovation. And, you know, if there's somebody who doesn't really value innovation, they're like, oh, just take it to a flavor house, you know, then that wouldn't be a great partner fit because you guys are always bumping heads and you, you can't grow together. So just being very aligned from the beginning is, is so important. Yeah. And I think as the founder, right, it's like sharing those those values openly so that any potential partner like knows what they're getting and they can kind of self-select to avoid, you know, sometimes it's, the, it's even better to tell people no or like, hey, you're, we're not a good fit, right? Like, don't, we don't want your money to work with us because we know for each of us, we're just going to be butting heads later. Um, it was interesting that you bring up that that point around founders taking money kind of early when maybe they, they shouldn't from the wrong people. Because I found that amongst hundreds of conversations with founders, Every the main problem that people have is around money, right? If you're not growing fast enough, you have money issues. If you're growing too fast, you still have money issues because you need to bring in money now and find it as fast as you can. Otherwise, it's going to stall your growth. And it leads to a lot of quick decision making that can ultimately cause really deep problems later on, as you mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well said. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So now tell me about Happy Pop and what you're, how you've been able to take all that experience and knowledge to creating your new product. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I, so Happy Pop 
came out of the idea came out of the pandemic. A lot of people are unhappy. We spend a ton of time on our phones or comparing ourselves to other individuals. And we wanted to create a functional beverage that you can actually feel right away, not something that you have to feel over time. Um, so we did a ton of research on like, what are those functional ingredients that can actually achieve that? Um, like for instance, we did a ton of research in the cannabis space and went to different manufacturers and talked to different founders and realized that that was just a really uh, hard barrier to entry and just not really scalable or it would take a ton of cash. So what we landed on is a mood boosting energy drink, um, mood boosting because we have an ingredient called Makuna purines, which um, contains L-DOPA. L-DOPA converts to dopamine in your body, has the highest concentration of L-DOPA in this one little bean. Um, and so we combine that with 100 milligrams of caffeine. Uh, from or, coffee beans. From coffee beans. Organic for a happy energy boost. And the best part of the formulation, because taste is always king, is we're not using any sugar alcohols or added sugar. It just comes, the sweetness comes we're from- We're artificial. Yeah. Yeah, it's all fruit juice and it's carbonated. And um, yeah, with this, we thought, um, yeah, we would take something and put it right at the same uh, quality, you know, and value as as Koya mm -hmm. and we didn't think anybody was really doing that in the energy space so we yeah I, I think I believe and maybe you you believe this too but there as the market becomes more and more crowded there are still white space opportunities that exist within existing uh spaces so energy there's many different types of energy uh there's like performance energy lifestyle energy we're going for mood boosting energy uh using this ingredient and um, with, when we create products, we want to create products that actually improve people's lives. Um, so just really quickly, I like to share this quote that I got recently from a review. A review. Um, someone said, Abs for the Tangerine Dream, absolutely amazing. My daughter who has anxiety has increased positive interactions with customers at work. And I've noticed that my work commute is a lot easier to deal with. I can't wait. That is amazing to hear those benefits from directly from from customers and knowing that this thing that you're putting out in the world is having the impact that that you want. I'm curious to know with you know when you first started started the business, you realized it was tough to kind of find that product market fit until you moved into protein. Now with Happy Pop, do you feel like you found product market fit just as fast? How does it kind of compare to that journey of of Koya and what you're seeing? Yeah, I want you to answer this, but it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, okay, I'll answer it. So then uh, I think we went really, really bold with the packaging, of course, some in a way that's almost polarizing, but it definitely captures your attention. Uh, we did have some issues in the beginning with just understanding how to really explain mood boosting energy. So we put functional energy, but we're also changing this. We worked with uh, Fred Hart at Interact to redo this packaging. So now our updated packaging has a more prominent um, brand mark and it says mood boosting energy on it because what we, from our feedback, we realized that customers didn't quite know what the product was. They just thought it was cool. So they grabbed it off the shelf. Um, yeah, I mean, Maya and I pretty much made this and we were so proud of it and we wanted just to do what, like, honestly, Koya is a very, we know who the target customer is and it's, it's a more conservative brand as it should be as a very specific value proposition. We just wanted to have some fun over here too. Yeah. And we wanted that to be communicated to the, to the end consumer as well. Yeah. So I, I think, um, we're kind of using some of the same rule book. Um, we were able to move much faster given our um, relationships. Uh, like we're working with the same distributor, the same manufacturer and things like that. But um, in a way that was different, I don't think we really, really understood true product market fit until we went viral recently on TikTok. Um, and that was through an accident, but it, it was like an, a blessing in disguise because we we started to see how customers were interacting with the product and, and what benefit that they received from it and which helped us change how we speak about the product and its benefits. Yeah, tell me about that because I think I saw that video where there's a someone who bought it that said erroneously that the problem contained kratom, right? 
which it doesn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So they were like, oh, it, it contains Kratom, but there's actually this drink called New Brew, which contains Kratom. Um, but she, the reason she said happy, 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 it's a happy drink. It made me feel happy. And, you know, the first 10 seconds of a video really captures the, the consumer's attention. And so people started Googling happy drink and they were like, well, there's something weird in here too. <laughs> and oh, it made happy, happy. Pop, yeah. Yeah. And so I think what really, really got people going was the it's a brand fit. The brand makes sense. Right. Um, the name makes sense for what the product does. And like all of that encompasses what attracts people to it. Yeah. Are you learning to um, I'm just always curious, right, like listening into how customers are talking about it on social to take cues in terms of the positioning language that you use and like what you call it. So I know you mentioned like happy, but you talk about like mood boosting and functional and I had a functional energy bar. So I know just how hard it is to really talk through some of those value props to, to customers. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like listening to the, some of those conversations, if you've been able to learn like other things that they're mentioning. Yeah, before we we would hide the Makuna or the mood boosting aspect and really focus on the energy and just say, hey, it'll be a surprise and delight. But then as we were talking to friends and, and customers, they were like, whoa, this Makuna is really exciting and interesting. Like, I want to I want to know more about it. And so we were like, wait, customers actually care about this ingredient. So maybe we should be really playing up the mood boost um, quality of it, which is why we changed from functional energy to mood boosting energy. I love that. Um, I know I asked a little bit a different way, but uh, Christopher had a question in terms of how different is your approach this time around, if at all different? I know you say you're working with some of the same distributors and retailers, but is there any other things that you've like changed completely in your process or how you're building the company um, this time around? Like we doing everything differently. Yeah, something <laughs> same. Yeah. Brand first. I think this time, I think with Koya, it was very much product first, brand later. And this time around, it, it's just given the, how the landscape has shifted. Uh, we really spent a lot of time building a strong brand and strong brand equity. Um, and then uh, making sure that the product was just great tasting to fit along with that and just having a perfect marriage and blend of it because you know if we could discover that early on it'll help out with like future issues i think when we started to scale koya and we were like well who is our customer and how do we like expand awareness um and with this product it's, it's kind of like you use a, a trojan horse to to get in through the door and use that consumer to expand to other consumers awesome i love that um, and then any other, and we're getting to the last couple of minutes here. So if anyone has any other questions for our guests, feel free to drop those into the chat. But through these 10 plus years of experience that you've had, any other takeaways that we haven't mentioned yet that you want to make sure to share with the founders who are listening into the call? Yeah. Um, so some advice um, that I received like back in 2016, as we were driving from Chicago with a U-Haul trailer behind our car to California, um, I gave uh, Jeff Church from the CEO, previous CEO of Suja, um, a phone call. And he said, he's a pretty straightforward man. And he's like, keep your head down. Don't cause any problems and work hard. And for a first time founder, that was the best advice. Every time I thought about you know, like anything, I just thought about those words and I calmed down, you know, because it's very stressful, right? Um, being a first time founder. And so that's the um, advice that I would, I would leave there. Yeah. I would also say um, just kind of staying, staying focused. Um, and you, if I, I would give an example, I think with Koya, what people know Koya for is like plant-based protein, but for the longest we were trying to be plant-based nutrition and that led to a lot of failed product lines, uh, which could one, confuse the sales team, confuse the customer versus kind of staying focused on what the customer loves about it and then expanding upon that. I think it would have saved us a lot of time and money. Yeah, I think what were some of those filled product line? I think you had like a energy line at one point, right? Yeah, it's like a co like a coffee. It's kind of like, you know, don't chase what your competitors are doing yeah. and stay true to what you do best. And and don't we actually had this conversation yesterday, mm -hmm. Mike. So I think it's so important to bring it up. Um, so I don't know if you guys remember a couple of years ago, Oddwalla just announced they were going out of business. Yeah. So hey, it's not the wrong thing to think, but just applying only logic to business 
in this CPG space cannot can be a very bad idea. And so what we thought was all that shelf space is opening up. We ran as fast as we could to take that shelf space before somebody else did. And that sounds like a good idea, but it didn't resonate with the customer. And yeah, smoothies. that was, <laughs> yeah, that's, that was a discode line. And, and so you have to look at it. It's not a one dimensional. You have to look at the full 360 um, and actually make sure the customers to point listening to the customers, customers didn't tell us they wanted that product line. Mm -hmm. We thought we knew more than they did. So always listen to the customer. And I think that's hard, right? Because I know in talk with investors, they're always talking about like, what's your platform? Like what other products can you release under here? So it gets you think as an entrepreneur, right? You're full of ideas. And so you're like, oh, there's a, you know, there's a dozen products that we could create under here. And sometimes you realize like, it really is just about like that focus and consistency. So I love that. Um, want to get one question in from Drew. They asked, what is your launch strategy when you were new to market and new to a retailer? I know you mentioned the importance of merchandising and demos, but you could, can you expand on like how you thought about trade spin, demos, promotions as you're launching? Yeah. Um, let's see if I can give an example, like when we had launched it to Whole Foods, we we had a plan to just like get a lot of like inf influencers on board people, just energy around the product, uh, get investors and and key people just talking about it. Um, we we did a little PR. Uh, we definitely knew that demos was important so for beverage, just like cans in hand is like the most important thing. And then also making sure that you're spending your dollars closest to the point of sale. Um, it's because a lot of people like to do an event out in Miami, but you're only sold in Los Angeles, you know, things like that. So just making sure you're being very strategic with your um, spend and that it's supporting those retailers if you're only in retail. Great advice. Maya, Dustin, and Marco, thanks so much for joining today and on the webinar. Really great feedback and great comments and learning from your stories. So as a reminder, this webinar is recorded. We'll be sending this out um, in the next day or so to everyone who was able to join. Thanks so much for the great questions. I see a bunch of thanks yous in the chats and good luck. I'm going to be continuing to follow Happy Pop to see where your journey leads next. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.